<laughs> okay. Uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, have, uh, announce our, our presenter today, uh, Abby Ellers, uh, who is the daughter of uh, Bob, uh, Ragtime Bob, uh, yes, Bob Darch. And uh, it's an amazing, amazing story. You know, he was one of the breakout uh, ragtime performers when the, it came alive again. I'm not going to talk about it very long because I don't want to take any thunder away from Abby. And uh, we're very happy to have you and your husband, Tom, here today. So without further ado, we're going to hear the story of Ragtime Bob Darch. Abby, it's all yours. Hello. Hey. Is that tilted towards me? Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Luke, for introducing me. And um, yeah, I'm Abby Ellers. And the reason I get to stand in front of you today uh, is because of my dad, Robert Darch, known to most people as Ragtime Bob Darch. And um, I am the eighth child and the youngest child that we know of from my dad. And I'll just interject that to give you a little sense of my dad and my dad's character. So he lived 82 long years. He lived them fully. And it would be hard in 45 minutes for me to tell you the whole story of my dad. So I put together a little outline. and. I am hopefully going to share a little bit about him that you might not learn if you Googled him, which if you Google him, you'll find out all sorts of interesting information. But I thought it might be interesting to you to learn a little bit about my dad as far as who he was, his character, etc. I brought a lot of memorabilia or artifacts or collateral, whatever you want to call that. But um, I'll start with my father was born in 1920 um, to immigrant parents. And I brought a photograph of his parents. Um, and this is important. He was the only child of this couple. And so there was, uh, this, this enters in a little bit because he had both the, the joy and the sadness of that. He, I think, felt lonely some of the time as a kid. And so he was constantly trying to make friends and um, get involved with people. But the flip side was he was a little bit spoiled as well um, because of being the, the only child. And one of the ways that he was spoiled um, was that he was offered the opportunity to have piano lessons. So if you think about um, 1920, and then you go forward about 10 years or so, you're landing right in the Great Depression. And my grandfather owned a grocery store. And many of the people who came to purchase groceries from my grandfather in downtown Detroit, which is where they lived, um, got in the arrears, as they say. And so my grandpa would trade them. He would barter. And one of the things for which he bartered um, was my father's piano lessons with a gentleman named Gene Turpin, who was the nephew of the ragtime great Tom Turpin. So my father had the opportunity to study with someone who was directly uh, influenced or connected, if you will, to ragtime music. So my grandmother, Adolfina Hemberger, yes, she was German. Um, was very adamant that the music that she wanted her son to learn would be classical music. Um, and that went well, and that is what my dad studied, as long as his mother, my grandmother, was out in the lobby listening. So he would play Bach, or he would play something. And then the second they would hear the door close, it would all shift, and the sheet music would come out. And they would play ragtime for about 40 minutes until they knew it was about time for Delphi to come back. And then my dad said they always went to Rachmaninoff, because that was her favorite. 
And um, so he became quite proficient. He uh, had a lot of time on his hands. And he also, because uh, again of um, perhaps being an only child and a little bit spoiled, was able to they had they had a piano in their home, and he practiced a lot. And I will say that my father's entire life, he practiced piano. He was a person who felt that if you have a skill, um, that you don't just rely on that skill, but you're constantly trying to develop it. And I will come back to that a little bit later. Um, but as I mentioned, my dad, being an only child, he was a little bit lonely and always trying to join groups and be involved. And um, he had a great sense of humor. And I'm sure he was probably a handful as a student. Um, so one of the things that he did was he joined the band. But as you can imagine, you can't march with a piano. So he also learned the trombone, the slide trombone. And this came. Uh, to become important to him later on. If any of you ever saw my father perform, one of the things that he would often do is he would during the middle of a song. So he, he was an entertainer. He performed solo. Uh, he would play with a band. Um, but his, his musical career was he was a solo pianist, ragtime piano player, and um, an entertainer. So we kind of segue forward here. He graduated from school. He went to Arizona, uh, to Tucson, actually, to study civil engineering. And he did not finish his degree there because he got waylaid by World War II. So he, he joined the service, and um, he ended up uh, going to officer's school. And then he was a paratrooper in World War II. He jumped into uh, occupied France three days post D-Day. And like many people of the greatest generation, he did not speak about that extensively. However, I have and neglected to bring, but I have all of his pins. You would receive a pin for different jumps that you would make. and. As an adult, I said to my dad on numerous occasions, you know, I've always thought it would be so cool to jump out of an airplane. And invariably, he would respond to me, it'd probably be fun if people weren't shooting at you. <laughs> so from that experience, he then spent some time um, in uh, Japan. And he worked with the Japanese contractors who would be rebuilding that country, uh, took a little segue through Hawaii, uh, ended up in Alaska, and um, lived in Alaska for an extensive period of time, uh, eventually returning to Michigan. And along the way, he married his high school sweetheart, Norma, and they had seven children together. So that brings us up to about 1954 with my dad. So that's kind of a little snapshot. Um, and I can fill in more information for you uh, if there are questions afterwards. And I'm happy to visit with you um, about some of the photographs that I brought and things like that to talk about that part. Um, so. My dad had become a lifelong military man. He was in the service, I believe, from 42 to 54. Um, he, was, um, he worked as a civil engineer with the, um, with the Army on a road that, uh, if you're familiar with Whittier, Alaska, there's a tunnel there. There's also a road that was put in to try and connect the Kenai um, Peninsula to Anchorage. So I don't know your familiarity with that area, but he was instrumental in working on that. Um, but he had this muse that would never leave him alone, and that was he had fallen madly in love with ragtime music, um, piano in particular. He was a historian in addition to being 
an entertainer. And part of his interest was to seek out these gentlemen in particular, it was predominantly um, male composers, but not exclusively, to seek out these gentlemen while they were still alive. And he was very disappointed that what he considered to be the first true American music was falling by the wayside. And he, he had this muse and um, he began what his family affectionately call the Ragtime Trail. So involved in the Ragtime Trail, which began in 1954, meant um, separating from his first family. And um, there's a lot of things that could be said or thought about that, and again, I'm happy to visit with you about that. Um, my siblings and I, probably would present somewhat different stories about the experience of our father. Um, and I'll leave it at that. So the Ragtime Trail began in Juneau, Alaska. So my father had left Alaska. The big project at Whittier had come to a close. He and Norma and the seven children were working diligently to start a resort, a lake resort at um, Caboggin Lake, which is um, in northern Michigan. Um, he was about 30 years ahead of his time, which quite often was the case with my dad. So this um, building of all these cabins and setting up this beautiful lake resort um, with a restaurant and a place where people could come and hear great music and such uh, failed. People at that point were still not quite doing the um, the tourism thing in the way that we do in this day and age. Now there's a very successful business there which started in about the year um, 2000. So, you know, he was just, he was just ahead of his time. So he left, um, depending upon which story you go with, to utilize his other skill that he had because he felt as if he had come to the end of the road with his military service. Things were slowing down at that point. And he um, went to Juneau, Alaska and began to play at the Red Dog Saloon. He said, I'll play for tips to begin. And they kept him on for months and months and months. And it drew in so many people that they eventually put him on salary. And he said where he started out with a bucket, like I saw a bucket going around. He said the bucket would have to be emptied partway through while, while he was performing. People were just mad for this music. It's infectious. Uh, it's delightful. Uh, it's lively. It's a little body, if you will. And um, I think it fit quite well with, um, with the kind of Alaskan mindset. So he said he used to meet the ships when they would come in. And he would ask everyone, does anyone have connections in Las Vegas? And finally, he met someone, Clyde Rowan, who happened to be, I don't know, perhaps some of you might have met Clyde Rowan. I see a head shaking um, from Hartsville, Missouri. Wonderful man, uh, not a musician, um, but he had some contacts in Las Vegas and he sent those, gave those to my father who left Alaska. He was a bit of a snowbird. Um, he used to say, go north in the summer and go south in the winter, Abby. Um, so, and we did a bit of that, but he made his way to Las Vegas and he played there somewhere and I, I didn't dig deeply enough. I have a photograph of um, my dad's name on one of those old um, Las Vegas strip um, huge signs um, at the Sands is where he played. And I have that like a little snapshot. Um, if you are the daughter of Ragtime Bob Darts, you have boxes and boxes and boxes and boxes of photographs. Um, and if he made one photograph and it turned out great, he would go and have about 27 of them printed and he would mail them to all of his best friends. So um, there's lots of photos out there. 
Um, he then made his way from Las Vegas. He played there for quite some time, and he went to the Reno, Nevada area and happened to go through Carson City, where he met a very lovely young woman um, and convinced her that nothing would be better than to join him on the Ragtime Trail, and that's my mom. So that's where I join into this story of, of my dad. Um, there were 18 years difference in their age. So my dad was 36, my mom was 18, and um, he swooped into town in a Lincoln convertible and swept her right off of her feet. She decided that no, she didn't want the full ride scholarship to the university. She would much rather just hop in that car and go off into, um, into life and, you know, that's what 18 year olds do and I am willing to bet if you ask my mom that she might have had quite a few times that she thought, I probably shouldn't have done that. <laughs> but do that she did. So they began the life of an itinerant ragtime musician, which I wanna come back to because that's how most ragtime musicians lived their lives. Um, they performed in different places, lots of them were composers, and my dad used to do this very interesting thing where he followed how ragtime became known from southwest Missouri, and, and I'll go into that a little bit here in a moment, but, and kind of spiraled out from there, and if you looked at the trajectory of my parents, it's very similar to that. So he swooped up this lovely lass in Carson City and away they went on this tour, um, the Ragtime Trail. So one of the things that's kind of, I think I'll just interject at this point, is that the way music was performed and where music was performed used to be very different. So hotels, um, most hotels, full service hotels, had a bar and they hired live musicians to perform at that bar. And so if you got on that circuit, if you became well known as an excellent musician who could bring in a lot of people, um, then they would send their, your name on to the next person and you could kind of travel around the United States and Canada um, performing. And that's what my dad did with my mom in tow. Um, I'll also interject this, my dad was not an adept trailer hauler, and he did, they did haul the piano everywhere with them. Uh, you can see a photograph of my dad's piano, it was an upright Cornish um, piano. He was adamant that Cornish was the best brand of upright pianos, and they hauled it everywhere. So that snowbird thing found my mom often being the person driving from Toronto, where they'd spent the summer, down to Fort Lauderdale, where we would spend the winter and back and forth. And whenever it was time to back the trailer in wherever it needed to go, it was my mom who did all of that, which has served her well because she's a horse woman and she can back up when she goes on trail rides with her girlfriends they all can haul their trailers but they all get out and my mom just backs them up like this far apart so it served her well you know it's a skill set that she's she's happy to have um, so along the way my father was collecting sheet music learning everything that he could about this music that he was so madly in love with and searching diligently to try to make connections with as many of the remaining composers and entertainers that he could. He was always highly disappointed that he was too late to meet Percy Winrick, who was from Joplin, Missouri, and died in 1952. So my dad stepped onto the trail a little late to meet Percy Winrick, um, um, Moonlight Bay, um, so many wonderful, wonderful songs. Um, I think I'm a rarity, I'm 60, and if someone started playing ragtime music and singing songs, I would probably know all of the lyrics. Sometimes I go to music festivals and I'm singing along and I'll see people older than me looking at me with this kind of peculiar, quizzical look of how I know all of these these lyrics, but it's because I grew up with it. 
So I showed up in 1958, made my arrival in Colorado Springs, Colorado. Um, my dad had been performing at the Cherry Creek Inn in Denver. And I want you to just think for a moment, my mom was not quite 19. Um, and her pregnancy experience was uh, she had lived in Seattle. She had lived in Denver. She had lived in uh, Las Vegas um, and had just traveled all around. She never saw the same pediatrician twice. She never saw you know, any of that and just happened to go into labor in Colorado Springs, so hence my birthplace. Um, I think of that now and Wow, um, you know, w we have different experiences or expectations at, in this day and age. But so, as my dad collected the sheet music, and if my father ever had his hand on a piece of sheet music that you get into your possession, I will guarantee it will have a stamp on it, a rubber stamp that says Ragtime Bob Darch. So my dad had a tremendous in interest in being known into perpetuity. Um, he, um, he was a great supporter of the underdog, but he was highly competitive. And if he found a piece of sheet music, he was going to put his stamp on it. In essence, I was here. Um, my siblings and I laugh that in our household, if you stood still for too long, daddy might have stamped us as well, um, which is probably true. He stamped every book that he read. Uh, he signed every piano that he ever played, including ones that I'm sure people are just aghast that he did this. He, at least on the fancy ones, opened it up and signed on the inside. Um, I can't say that he always did that. Um, so let me um, kind of bead in here a little bit into why Southwest Missouri. So if I say the name Scott Joplin, you'll undoubtedly all nod your head. It's a person you've heard of. Um, perhaps you've also heard of John Stark. Anyone? Yes? Who was the music producer and um, publisher of all of the regs. So if you go to Sedalia, Missouri, that is where John Stark's first office was. And Scott Joplin made his way up to Sedalia because John Stark was known for being an individual who liked this type of music and wanted to promote this type of music. Um, he subsequently, John Stark and Scott Joplin, moved on to St. Louis. But if you go back into the John Stark history, you will find that the majority of the ragtime composers went through that publishing house for their sheet music to um, be spread. And you know, again, if you think about how times change with music, so you know, my dad played at hotel bars because that was a viable income for him for a very long time. But as we all know, we don't really think of hotel bars now as the primary place that we would go to hear music. There's different venues, and that changed and kind of you know, ran its course, if you will. But music in the 1890s through the 1920s was sheet music. And so it was, um, you know, someone would get a piece of music and they would learn it. Someone else would hear it. They would buy that piece of music. So in the way that we offer CDs or things such as that, um, but you had a different interaction with it because not only did you get the music, um, and all the lyrics and all of that, but you, you, you had the actual written music so you could learn to play it yourself. So music spread in a very different fashion than how music spreads in this day and age. So if you think of Percy Wenrick and if you think of um, James Scott, another one of the unrecognized but really gifted um, musicians, ragtime composers. Uh, you think of Scott Joplin, and then you have John Stark. And then you start adding in things like the St. Louis um, 
uh, fair, the Chicago Fair, so 1896, 1906, and people are hearing this music. Scott Joplin wrote um, The Cascades, one of the most beautiful rags that you will ever hear. Um, and he wrote it in honor of at the World's Fair in, um, in St. Louis, in front of what is now the art museum, was a beautiful waterfall cascade that had been built um, for the World's Fair. And Scott Joplin wrote this song. It's a tremendous song. I, I encourage you to search out that piece of music. So Southwest Missouri, for that reason, but in addition to that, my father was also a Civil War buff um, and could tell you pretty much every battle. He had, as I mentioned, gone to officer school. He had studied um, Civil War history extensively. And um, so he came to this area. We played, he played, um, at Mickey Mantle's Holiday Inn which is kind of an odd thing because it's the only time that Holiday Inn allowed somebody else's name, the owner, to go on it in that way. There's photographs where it says, Mickey Mantle's Holiday Inn. And then real quickly they were like, that's not a good idea. And so um, that, to my knowledge, is the only one that ended up that way. He also played at the Glass Hat um, in downtown um, Joplin, which sadly was torn down. Uh, I do want to challenge you. Um, I want to say that I believe I'm the only person in this room that was um, babysat by Mickey Mantle. Can anyone match that? <laughs> oh, Chris says he can. There you go. Well, I, I did too, only I was just a little thing playing in the swimming pool. And when my parents went to look uh, at this home that they eventually purchased, um, I was left with Mickey Mantle and his sons, and um, I he was my babysitter for that day. So uh, I only know this because somebody told me, and I wasn't old enough to remember it. So, but that's my there's there's my claim to fame. Anyway, um, so we have the birth of ragtime. We have it happening in Southwest Missouri. We had the Civil War, and we have a home built in 1840 that um, was is known as the Ritchie Mansion. It's on the National Historic Site. And my parents, uh, luckily my mom also shared my dad's interest in the Civil War, and actually continues to this day to attend a once a month Civil War round table in Kansas City, Missouri. She's very knowledgeable about uh, the Civil War and, and such. So they purchased this home uh, a beautiful brick home in the town of Newtonia, Missouri. Um, and it was owned, built by Matthew Ritchie. Actually, let's be clear. It was built by slaves who were owned by Matthew Ritchie. Uh, he was a union officer, uh, and he uh, owned all of the land for 50 miles around there. It's beautiful there, by the way. Um, anyway, my parents bought this. There was a huge hole in the wall. I'll show you. Um, and as a child growing up, I would find um, mini balls, um, like cannonballs and uh, bullets and uh, Civil War belt buckles. Um, so I, I teach cooking. I teach in the hospitality department at Missouri State. And before uh, they turned me loose with food, I, would, I made a mean mud pie. So that's where I would find these things. I was constantly digging and trying to make, like, cook out in the yard, so I would say, hey mom, look at this. Um, anyway, so my my dad would, um, he was performing in Joplin, they bought this house, they started fixing it up, and um, he, had a, he had a good good gig going. Um, you know, we were still going back and forth, doing the snowbird thing, um, and I wanna just say that I've spoken to people who, who saw my dad at perform at this time, and more than one of them have told me that he had over 1,500 songs committed to memory, that someone could just call, call that song out. He could either play it and or sing, and really most of the verses. Um, it was quite remarkable. He had uh, such a sharp mind, a remarkable mind, and, and such a love, again, for, for this. Um, 
yeah, so that kind of gives us that chunk, right? So now I just want to talk a little bit about his efforts to keep ragtime music alive. So I mentioned that he searched out these people, and probably his um, the thing he's most well known for um, is that he went specifically and found UB Blank. And UB Blake uh, was living in um, Brooklyn, uh, New York City. Um, and my dad found his address and just went, just went by to visit with him. And UB had been highly neglected by this point. His musical career was thought to be at, at an end. Um, but my dad believed otherwise and brought him out. The first place that he took him was to Toronto to perform. And he was, of course, highly received. Um, does anyone here play piano? Yeah, UB Blake's hands, um, he could reach 13 notes. Yeah, he had, he had these giant, beautiful, beautiful hands. Um, I had the honor of getting to know UB um, as a young girl. He called me his au fait niece. Um, so I was his white, white niece. Um, my father also um, met and brought out of retirement Charlie Thompson and um, Joe Jordan as well. He was also very good friends with Joseph Lamb, uh, in my opinion, probably the finest ragtime composer. You might write that one down. His music is so beautiful, uh, so beautiful, Joseph Lamb. Anyway, over here, and maybe Tom, do you mind grabbing that album cover? So my dad put together um, Golden Reunion in Ragtime. And I just want to tell you a tiny bit, uh, a little story about this. This was, um, thank you, you can send it around if you want. The one I played on oh, great, thank you, Kenny. So um, think about uh, the South uh, in the early 1960s. Uh, think about uh, being. Um, black men brought into that environment. Um, so there was this wonderful recording studio. My dad had done Gold Rush Days, which is another album cover I have over there. Had gotten to know, um, uh, had gotten to know the, um, oh dear, I'm drawing a blank. What do you call the people who record the? Engineer, Engineer. thank you so much. Um, little. Anyway, um, so he knew that he wanted these gentlemen to come together. But because my dad was a bit of a trickster and uh, really had a love for kind of fun and making things happen, he invited each of these three men without telling the other one that they were being invited. Um, so he went with my mom and, and picked up UB Blake and um, so there's a, uh, so, so we had UB Blake in the car with us. And then um, my dad had to go somewhere else to pick up Charlie Thompson to, I can't recall, um, I was little, but um, had to go somewhere else. And he went and picked up Charlie Thompson. And then they together went, unbeknownst to Charlie, to pick up Joe Jordan. And, as they were driving by, George, Joe Jordan came out in front of the train station, and my dad said Charlie Thompson started like hitting him and hitting him and going, that's Mouse, that's Mouse. That was his nickname for him. They had performed together. They knew each other. They hadn't seen each other. They were living on opposite coasts. And he said, you got to stop the car, Bob. Anyway, so Daddy did, of course, knowing what was going on. Um, so that's kind of a funny story of how they came together. Um, the reason I mention being in the South is my mom then had the responsibility of driving UB down. Unbeknownst to him, he thought he was going to the recording studio, and indeed we were, but he didn't know that his two compadres were going to be there. So he was this gentle, wonderful man, and I was sitting in his lap. And my mother was driving the automobile. So here we are, early 1960s, white woman driving a nice car, black man, little girl sitting on the black man's lap. And the next thing we knew, um, people were shouting at us and throwing things at us. And it was quite terrifying. And Yubi, who I knew so well, of course, 
when I became frightened, what did I do but wrap my arms more tightly around him? And finally, he said, Ab Abby, you, ha you, have to, you have to sit here because the more I hugged him, the more riled up people were getting. So um, uh, that's a, a sad little story about this, but I think it's important because my, my dad uh, stepped across those boundaries and really was like, if that's your problem, that apparently is your problem, but it was not his problem. Um, he thought nothing of us going into the neighborhoods where these men lived, we went to their homes, and that was kind of unheard of really at, at that time. It's a sad, sad part of our story, but I'm, I'm proud of my dad for, for that, for crossing what could have been considered racial racial boundaries there, if you will. Um, so he brought these men together. It's great recording, and um, thank you, Kenny, for, for promoting that from time to time on your, on your show. In addition, though, he was not only interested in bringing about the um, kind of revival of these men, but he also was very interested in developing protégés, which he did, many of them. Um, there are a lot of people who are out there still performing in a variety of ways, and they would attribute their career to the fact, not that my dad taught them how to play piano, because as I mentioned, he has eight children that we are aware of. He did not teach any of us how to play piano, but he did teach these young men and young women. He took a lot of young women under his wing as well, and he taught them the ropes of being on the road, how to do contracts, how to fight for contracts, how to be a musician and be able to earn a living as a musician, and he was adamant about that. Another thing is he started ragtime festivals all around the United States and Canada, so perhaps you're familiar with the Sedalia Ragtime Festival. That one goes on uh, the Great Lakes Festival. Um, there are festivals that happen in um, uh, uh, on the Thousand Islands, so uh, in northern um, New York. Um, there's, uh, there's one in Toronto that still goes on, the Ragtime Jazz Time Festival. And he was instrumental in each and every one of these. He would come if somebody, if he could find a group of community leaders who were willing to jump in and do the work, he was right there with them making it happen. He would invite the people that needed to come. He would say, this would be a great idea. This is how long they should play. Let's do this. No, don't put this person after that person. You know, you want to create some balance, and he was really gifted in that. Um, so yes, he he found the old people, he developed the young people, he created these festivals. He had a burning desire to keep this music alive. Um, so along with this, as you can imagine, there was not a lot of home time, and so. Um, Eventually, my parents divorced, and my dad went off to um, uh, to Europe after they divorced. Uh, I think he was quite shocked, um, which is he was really intelligent, but he was he 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 missed some important parts there. Um, the fact that he was shocked. Um, anyway, I, you know, you, he hadn't been home in like six months, and then anyway, oh, that was my phone. How rude. Um, Anyway, off to Europe he goes, because he had met a lot of people from Europe, and he had gone on one tour, and he had a friend in Copenhagen who said, come on over, I, you know, he worked in the music industry, come on over. So I went for a period of four years where I did not see my dad, because he stayed in Europe the whole time. He was predominantly in the Scandinavian countries, he made his way then into, he spent a little time in Germany um, with his family, his, um, his mom's um, family, side of the family, and he went then to England, and eventually met Colm O'Brien, a good, a good Irish lad from uh, from Ireland, who he went and spent time with. And one of the antics, and I have some clippings of this, in 1981, my dad arranged with the Guinness Company to have a helicopter airlifted to the top of Blarney Castle, where he performed, to our knowledge, the only ragtime performance on top of an ancient castle that has ever occurred in Ireland. So um, there's some photographs there that, that I can look at with you. 
Um, anyway, so I want to, um, in being mindful of my time, I want to give you a little bit about his character. And I thought I would do this through some of his sayings that I can then elaborate on. So my dad lived quite effectively on about four to five hours of sleep his entire life. And he was lively, he was vivacious, he was rarely cranky. Uh, he just didn't need as much sleep as the rest of us. Um, so he would perform until two o'clock in the morning. He would come home, um, he would go to bed, he would be up typically about 5 a.m., maybe 6 a.m. if he slept in the next morning. And what I awoke to most mornings was, hey kid, Let's move that toe, which meant get up. Let's go do something. There's got to be something to do here. So I spent a lot of my youth, um, because I, my mom and I stayed behind in the mansion house, and we would go every Christmas and every holiday that we could. We would go wherever he was, because he was always somewhere a lot more interesting than Newtonia, Missouri, I can assure you. Um, anyway, he. Um, he, that's how he learned a new city, is he would get up and we would just walk, and then what, whatever we would find. It took me a while to realize he was looking for bars, but um, so that brings me to my next sayings. So my, one of my dad's favorite sayings, he, he liked bourbon, I think that's fair. He liked bourbon, um, and he would rattle the ice cubes and he'd say, a little toddy for the body. Um, and when it was time, about time to leave, whether we were visiting someone or he was at a bar or something, he would say, ah, just one more final, fi one final final. And then he would say, and now the last final final. So as a kid, this was kind of boring. I'm going to be really honest. So, um, but it went with, it went with the music, it went with the times. You know, he was performing in bars. I also will say that at that point, 75% of Americans smoked cigarettes, and um, my dad never did. Um, but he was, that's the environment that he worked in. He would, he would go on the stage at nine o'clock. This is one of his vests. Um, he wore a skimmer, you can see that over there. Um, and, you know, he had his costume, he put it on, it was a job to him, I realized that. I also want to say, there was never a time that I saw my dad go on stage that I didn't realize that he was a tiny bit nervous, even after 50 years, that he didn't have just a moment of, he, not so much stage fright, he wanted to give his best every single time. And he worked hard at that. As I mentioned, he practiced piano every single day. Growing up, I can attest to the man playing piano at some point throughout the day, two to three hours minimum, always. He, he just, he would not miss. And if he was somewhere where there wasn't a piano, he found a music store and he would go in and he would play. Um, so there's a painting by my uh, college roommate, Alicia Brundage, fabulous, fabulous artist, of three dancing girls, and my dad in the, in the bottom corner there. Um, anyway, whenever my dad was surrounded by beautiful women, he would always say, he would look around like this. Practice the piano, mother said. Practice the piano. He liked beautiful women. Okay. Um, how am I doing on time? Very, very good. Okay, all right. Another, uh, five minutes. Okay, yeah, yeah, good. Um, so I want to tell you another kind of funny story. So my dad was constantly coming up with antics. So one, um, when I was, I think, about 14 years old, <clears throat> pardon me, about 14 years old, my dad was home and I was, you know, I was a young teenager and I liked to sleep in. So he comes and he's like, come on, kid, we're going to move that toe. And he's like rattling me. And I'm like, what's up, daddy? And he goes, I already picked out your outfit. <laughs> I, okay, what, you know, what's going on here? So he's gone into my closet and he has picked out what, in my opinion, was the most beautiful maxi skirt, long skirt. I loved it. It was linen. It had purple flowers on it. It was my favorite skirt. I thought it was gorgeous. And he said, this is 
going to be perfect. He matched that with his ratty, ratty old um, green wool sweater with holes in it, moth holes. It was his favorite. You know, it's just god awful. And I'm thinking to myself, what are we doing? So we load up into this old pickup truck with a piano in the back. There was always a piano. People were constantly. Um, having to haul pianos for that man. Who in this room had to haul pianos for my dad? Yeah, you were in. Johnny had to haul some. Bob McCroskey, if you didn't have to pick up a piano, I'm stunned. Yeah, Katie's, yeah, yeah, well, anyway. So we drive out to the city dump. My dad has written a piece of music that's called Music for People Down in the Dumps. He unloads the piano in the dump, in the smelliest, stinkiest, like just, you know, like if you could draw it, it would have those lines coming up. And he says, Abigail, you go out there and you're gonna be the rag picker. And I'm like, what, in my skirt? And he said, yeah, you're gonna be in the background. So he's got me in like a babushka, kinda, I don't know what you call those things. And I'm in the background, Some I couldn't lay my hands on it. I've got a big poster of this. But it gets funnier because here's my dad playing piano, you know, and it's music for people down in the dumps. And we are, we are virtually, we are in the dumps with me in the background in my favorite skirt. Anyway, um, when we go to leave, so he's got people there to help him load the piano back up. When we go to leave, they think we're stealing the piano, and they won't let us leave. And they said, you can't just drive in and take things out of the dump. And my dad's like, this is my piano. And they wanted him to pay $100 for it. And I don't remember exactly how that turned out, but um, I want to tell one other quick story, and then I'm going to get to the slowing down in the end part here. When we moved to Newtonia, Missouri, um, eventually my siblings came to live with us. Not, not the oldest three, because they were substantially older than me, but my four brothers uh, moved to Newtonia, Missouri. And with all of us, there were 100 people in town. And Newtonia um, is just to give you a point of reference, about halfway between Neosho, Missouri and Monette. Um, and um, many of the people wore bib overalls and um, you know, we had a general store. It was that quintessential Southwest Missouri kind of town. Um, so, but we came there from Southern Florida. So these, here's my dad who always wanted the place to look like a park and he's wearing short shorts. He, he had beautiful legs and he prided himself on those legs, but he would wear short shorts. Um, he would take off his shirt and he would put a flamethrower tank on his back to, because we had brick sidewalks and he wanted no weeds in them. So he would fire up this propane tank and he would be out there with a toddy for the body wearing boat shoes and, and mowing the lawn and sweating profusely. He'd mow the lawn in the middle of the day because he wanted to get a tan. And people would drive back and forth just gaping at my dad. Um, and he, I, I think he might have liked that attention. So I think, yeah. Okay, so I want to move to kind of the end of, end of his life. So he, uh, as we all will, and perhaps already are, uh, he began to slow down. And um, in, um, uh, for his 80th birthday, the Tom Turpin um, Festival uh, was dedicated in honor of my father for his 80th birthday in Savannah, Georgia. And um, most of his children made it. Um, so many of his friends made it. And it was just a delightful experience. He was recognized by his peers. He had his family there. It was really a very beautiful and, and meaningful time. Um, he then went from there. He went up to, um, to Alaska to visit his beloved Alaska. And uh, when he came home, I noticed that the spunk was out of my dad. Uh, he came back from Alaska and he slept. He stayed at our home and it seemed like he slept for three or four days. Um, he didn't get up and do his three or five mile walk, which he did religiously. And um, 
I knew something was wrong, and he came to me and he said, "I found this thing on my throat." Um, and I, I said, "We're you know we're going to the doctor." Took him to the doctor, and he was diagnosed with throat cancer, which is eventually um, what um, what killed him. Um, what he died from. Um, I say killed him because, remember I said that about 75% of people smoking, his oncologist said to me, your father is a textbook example of secondhand smoke. He said the way that it presents itself, um, and and so you know his lifestyle. But he, what he was exceedingly proud of was that when they ran liver tests, they said you have a liver of a 30 year old. And you can't imagine, you know, how happy that made him. He told everybody that because he had been hitting the booze hard for a long, long time. So my dad's final public appearance, we have a framed poster of that, was right here in Springfield. He wrote uh, a song that is entitled C Street Rag. He performed it. Uh, I, uh, I wish Mary Collette was here to publicly uh, acknowledge for that because she was instrumental in arranging for my dad to perform there. And um, anyway, yeah, if you look at that, it's the Frisco High Line, um, the Burlington Northern, but in the middle of the engine is my dad's face. So Mary Collette put that together. It's a great poster. I love it a lot. Um, so that was his last um, uh, public presentation, uh, but he was, he was buried in Sedalia. I've got some photos of that over there as well. Um, 400 people in attendance. We had a New Orleans style uh, ceremony. It was amazing. Uh, we had Butch Thompson play clarinet, uh, fabulous clarinetist. Uh, my husband Tom built the gravestone, uh, and my father had designed it. So, you know, he wanted to be known. He had been looking at gravestones forever and ever, going to find where these people were buried and such. Um, so he knew he wanted it to have a cap that would cover over the edge of where the letters are. Um, and so I will just read to you what my father wrote for his epitaph on his gravestone. Tis said the devil pingent has for all musicians playing jazz, but angels came and took our bob to play pure ragtime just for God. So that's on one side, and on the other side, along with his name and birth date and date of passing, I expected this, and here I am always the supreme optimist. And I'll leave you with that. Sure. If anyone has questions, I'm so happy. Yeah, how are you? Good. Uh, was he ever a mentor or an idol of Gary Ellison? Yes, absolutely. Gary Ellison is one of the people who was a protege of my dad. And I neglected to mention that another thing that brought my dad here was the Ozark Jubilee. So he performed in 1960 on the Ozark Jubilee. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. He did. As a matter of fact, Mimi Blay is one of the individuals. Uh, the first time she performed at a ragtime festival was in Upper State New York. My dad was the person who brought her down, and I I got to watch her very first ragtime performance. We met her in San Luis Obispo, California. Mm. She was there visiting a friend of ours, and she put on a personal concert. She's a brilliant pianist. Classically, classically trained. But Mimi Blay, if you asked her about my father, she would say, the reason I'm on the ragtime trail, which that's his, that's his idea, is that it just keeps going. But yeah, he arranged for her to come and play at the St. Lawrence Festival. Mm -hmm. Kenny. I'm looking around to see if anyone else made it to the Sedalia Funeral Services for Bob. I was there, and it was a colossal ceremonies, as she said, over 400 people attended, and there were three or four things Bob insisted were present. Court of Bourbon. Old Crow. Yes, Old Crow, which my family sold for years. Only the finest. A set of playing dice, a deck of cards, and all the friends you could gather. Mm -hmm. We played his music, and, and in his coffin we put the sheet music and what was left of the whiskey and the dice and the playing cards. <laughs> This is, this is true, yeah. 
Yeah, I, uh, first time I ever heard of Bob Darch was years before I moved to Missouri in New York. Uh, I knew a woman whose grandfather had an old time music store, and he had a huge collection of sheet music, mm -hmm. and he had a whole portfolio of ragtime that was stamped ragtime Bob. Darch. Oh yeah. I never heard. Yeah. And, and incidentally, my father was born in 1920 in Detroit to an immigrant German mother. Interesting. You know, um, there, my dad remember, recalls his mother because there was such an anti-German sentiment at that time, which is funny how far we come and we go full circle with how we, you know, don't, don't like certain people and we don't want you here. But as a young boy, he remembers people saying very unkind things to his, to his German mom. And I think that impacted some things for my, for my dad. Yeah. Uh, at one point, I managed a bookstore for Carol E. Bradham. Yeah. And your dad would come in occasionally looking for books or sheet music. Mm -hmm. And one day, I asked him just uh, some casual question about stride piano. Mm. And there was a piano there at the store. Oh, yeah. He took me back there and sat down and gave me about a 20-minute tutorial. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's great. Lucky you. Some of my fondest memories of performing are when my dad was ill, he lived with um, my husband Tom and I. And um, as I said, he always practiced piano. And so I would be in preparing meals and he would, you know, he loved nothing more than just getting to start. You know, he would just start on a tune and that would lead to another one. And, um, you know, I loved him as a performer, but, um, you know, th those are probably my most precious memories as far as him playing piano. So, yeah. Any other questions? I have lots of stories, so if anyone wants to, you know, ask me things afterwards, that's fine. But I thank you, and I'm excited to have been invited. I'm Great. appreciative. Abby, Abby, we want to thank you very much for an interesting, informative, and articulate presentation today. You know, when I was listening to this story, I realize you really have a marvelous story here that has all the requisites for a movie. You know, you've got happiness, you've got some sadness, uh, melancholy, and an amazing story of a performer who uh, really made a difference. And hopefully, Ragtime will continue due to his efforts forever. I hope so too. Thank you again. Thank you very much.